morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you may be. I am very excited to get to host this panel. I have some, uh, some uh, old and new friends here, so very excited to get caught up. Um, a lot of folks are looking at security. How do people get into security? And those of us who've been in it, how do we stay in it so long? <laughs> I think a lot of us have been firefighting for a while, and uh, the twists and turns can certainly be um, challenging sometimes. So today we have a great panel to talk to. Um, Carolyn Wong, Jeffrey Carpenter, Katie Masuras, and Nazira Collage, excuse me, um, have been in the industry and come at it from many different angles. We have folks representing all kinds of different businesses and vendors and backgrounds. And I don't want to take up too much time because I, I just kind of want to jump in and get started uh, this morning, folks, uh, especially for those of us who it's a little early. Um, one of the things is, let's just go through and get the first question over this. Like, how did you get into the industry? What, what got you started? Um, Carolyn, can we start with you, please? Sure. So uh, just first, I actually want to say uh, thank you so much, Sean and Tracy. And I'm just super excited to be here. Um, how did I get started? So when I was 16 or 17 years old, my father, who is a Chinese immigrant, asked me, uh, what would you like to study in college? And I said, I would like to study dance because I love dance, or I would like to study psychology because I think that's very interesting. And he's a Chinese immigrant to the United States. So he said, you're going to study engineering and you're going to attend the best school you get accepted to. And so what happened was I studied electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. When I was a junior in college, uh, I, I thought, oh, now it's time to look for a summer internship. Uh, I applied to 50 or so companies around where my boyfriend at the time's family was based because I wanted to stay with his family instead of my family that summer. Uh, and I ended up getting an internship at eBay. I graduated from school and I said, oh, you know, I have enjoyed this so much. I would really like to work here full time. And they said, well, uh, IT has a hiring freeze, so we don't have a position for you, but there's an entry-level position uh, in information security. There's actually a couple. And at the time, this was 2005, I said, I don't know what information security means. And they said, that's okay. You know, the, they were looking for a new college grad uh, and the rest, the, 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 the last 16 years are, are now history. <laughs> Though that you made it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Nazira, how about you? What was your, where did you come from? Where was your background from? You know, I think it's kind of going to be similar. So I, um, I, I grew up in Central Asia, for those who don't know. Um, that's where I went to college. Um, so when I was graduating high school, I wanted to do something with math because I love math. And so basically I had two choices, economics or computer science. Um, and I was like, hmm. Let's, let's go computer science. <laughs> and that's how I ended up uh, being. So I finished my bachelor's in computer science. And then after that, I had a, a great opportunity to do uh, my master's in India. And so I spent three years in India doing my master's. Um, I didn't take any security related courses. I mean, they didn't offer any in my undergrad, my grad, nothing. Um, and after finish, I, I finished my uh, master's, I had opportunity to intern with World Bank. And um, that group, the group that I was interning ended up being in security and enterprise security. And that's how I ended up in security. So it was purely, you know, it, it wasn't intentional. It just happened to be my first internship in security. And that's how I started um, uh, in security. And just like how I addressed this history. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Katie, how did you get started? Well, first of all, again, thank you so much for having me on this panel and um, you and, and the fellow panelists are among my favorite people in this industry. So it's it was a pleasure to get up this early. Let me just say that. Um, so how did I get started in security? Well, before there was an industry, I was hacking things. So in the late 80s, when I was a teenager, um, I was on a local bulletin board system in, you know, um, near uh, Boston where I grew up. And um, it was some of the same members of the loft hacking group were 
were on that, that same BBS, as well as the cult of the dead cow and some of the earliest hacking groups. So I grew up hacking and there wasn't really a career in it back then. So um, when I went to college, I studied molecular biology and mathematics. And um, then I decided that I didn't want to work in molecular biology and mathematics, and, but I was still good at computers. So, um, so you know, I made a few transitionary hops, um, first doing systems administration at the Genome Center at MIT where I was working and then moved into systems administration again at the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. And we were getting attacked left and right. So there was my opportunity to dust off the old hacking skills, but instead hack myself before someone else could. Um, and then I became a professional penetration tester just at the very beginning of when that industry was starting again with some of my old childhood friends um, former loft members who had started a consultancy called At Stake. And um, I think it was, At Stake was acquired by Symantec and Symantec um, sent me off along with a, lo a lot of other At Stakers to eBay where I actually met Caroline and, and members of her team um, in the early, you know, early days of eBay security. I remember finding some very weird vulnerabilities which I hope still don't exist, but you know, they're not paying me anymore to check, so it's fine. Um, but you know, long winding journey. And I would say, you know, that anybody in our industry who's been around for a while has probably had an unusual path or a non-traditional path. So I want to encourage people out there to definitely, you know, take leaps of faith, especially in yourself. I think that's a great point, Katie. It's everyone I've met, no one has had the typical, I studied computer science for four years, 20 years ago, because you're right, it didn't exist. Jeffrey, how did you get involved? How did you come here? Well, thanks, first, thanks for having me on this panel. It's an honor uh, to be here with my colleagues. Uh, well, I actually haven't told this story uh, very, very often. My first entry to computer security was in high school. We had a multi-user PDP-11, I'm dating myself, uh, system, and I modified, I'm not going to use the word hacked, I modified a system program so that if you run it and enter a certain keystroke, it allowed you to change yourself to any user on the system, and I got busted uh, for, for doing it. So that was my first. For, so I then, from that point on, redirected my efforts to more honorable, uh, the honorable side. And my first job was in enterprise IT at the University of Pittsburgh, and that gave me a fantastic background of how do you, how do you build scalable, secure services to serve 50,000 uh, users. And at the time, um, the physics department was starting to get broken into very frequently and we would they'd be broken into we'd have to go help them recover and i tried to get the leadership of the computer center to realize we got to create a response team we have to make this more formalized we have to help these departments and they really weren't interested and i was very fortunate based on location that the cert coordination center at carnegie mellon was right across the street and they were hiring and i was hired as a uh, entry-level incident response analyst uh, at the CERT Coordination Center and ended up staying with CERT for 20, for 20 years. So that's, that's how I got started. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing. I, I love it when it's stories we haven't heard before. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ooh, the good, get in the dirt. So lots of experience here on this panel, folks who've been, been doing this and coming at it from different angles. So, you know, coming at it from comms, coming at it from penetration testing, um, I myself am a former veterinary technician. Um, again, it, it, it all comes down to getting the foot in the door. What do you all consider as, what's something important as a security professional? If you were kind of advising somebody who's getting in, what would you, how would you direct them? Jeffrey, let's start with you, please. Well, I think it's, it's really important not to only focus on the technical skills. A lot of times in our industry, people think the technical skills are the most important thing and they focus on, on that, but that's not necessarily the most important thing. It certainly is important, but it's one of many things. So you really need to ensure that, that in your career and when you're preparing yourself for your career, that... Uh, you know, that communication is extremely important. Your ability to present, you know, both the written and oral communication are very important. Collaboration skills, 
uh, investigation, just basic investigation skills, intellectual curiosity. So there's a lot more than just the technical skills that people tend to focus on and think are the most important. I was never the most technical person in, in any security room that I've been in. And that's not what has helped me be successful. It's been bringing people together, helping them collaborate, help them reach decisions and reach understandings together. And so it's important to focus in other areas, not just technical. Excellent. Uh, does anyone else have something they'd like to add? I think that um, something that's happened to me one million times throughout my career is that I encounter something that I don't know or that I've never done before. Uh, and I would say uh, to, to any of us in the industry or, or starting out in the industry, don't be afraid of that. That is going to happen. Just, just be curious and just have a learning mindset. Um, so number one, focus on learning. The other thing is that uh, I've had a variety of like really positive and really not so positive experiences throughout my career. Um, and I want to actually quote an online yoga teacher I follow, uh, Yoga with Adrian. She says, find what feels good. And I think that not everyone is good at everything. And not every context is right for every person. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, this doesn't feel very good, then maybe that's an opportunity to focus on what does feel good. If you're interacting with someone and you're like, wow, this is a really positive, enriching, encouraging experience. You know, I'm really connecting with this person. Like that's a person to spend more time with, you know? And if you encounter someone and they're putting you down or they're not treating you well, that's a person to like try not to spend time with. So I would say number one, focus on learning. Number two, like Adrian from Yoga with Adrian says, you know, find, find what feels good. I love it. Katie, did you, it looked like you had something more to add. You know, I couldn't have said it better in terms of keeping that open and learning mindset. Um, honestly, the field is so new and so relatively green. And as we're seeing from all these ransomware attacks, definitely, definitely not a solved problem, you know, in terms of getting uh, getting everybody to the level of cybersecurity that, that we need, you know, everyone to be at. Um, so I think that preserving that, you know, open mind and curiosity, and then understanding that, you know, taking your experiences from one place, there's always another place that needs to know what you have to offer, right? So manage your, you know, sort of manage your career path, try and learn new things, but also take those career opportunities where you might be able to, you know, be in charge of an organization at your next job where, you know, and apply the things that you learned not being in charge and being a team member, you know, at your previous job. Um, that's something that is also, you know, in terms of just general career advice. Um, we live in an era where it's normal to change jobs every couple of years or so. And, you know, when I was kind of coming up career wise, that was certainly frowned upon. You know, um, I spent my first four years of my career working at one place because, you know, I thought you tried to get a job and stay there for life and kind of progress up the ladder. But career wise, you know, especially in cybersecurity, don't let that that mindset limit you, especially when there are new areas to learn and new organizations that might need to learn what you specifically have, um, have amassed in terms of your knowledge. Great advice. Nazira, do you have anything else to add? I mean, same thing. I think um, just to reiterate about, there are so many roles in security, right? So if you start somewhere and you don't like it, try something else. I mean, there's so many things and you need to find something that's you're passionate about, right? So that makes you, you know, happy. You, you know, look at the day as like, oh, I'm going to go all this, solve all these problems, right? And I think security provides you that opportunities. There's so many roles and don't feel discouraged if you go take your first security job and you hate it. Um, you know, there must be something else for you. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of experience on this panel. So let's kind of move on to the questions about how we have survived so long doing, doing the kinds of jobs we do. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, what would you do differently? Is there something you would change, something that you would try and do better, something that you maybe would have let go of sooner in your career now that you're kind of looking back at it? 
I Carolyn, can please. Um, I guess if looking back, I mean, there was a period of time in my career where, you know, even though people around told me like, oh, you need to go, you know, you should go to leadership management track. I resisted that for a while. I was like, no, I like being technical. I want to be IC. Um, so I think, you know, um, obviously you need to do what feels right. And, um, but I think it's, for me, it was just, it took probably a little bit longer to make that decision, even though I don't regret that decision, right? I definitely love what I do. Um, but I, I guess my advice is listen, you know? Um, and um, so, yeah, it, for me, I think it, that decision took a little longer. Um, you know, maybe maybe it was for a reason. I, I wanted to be completely sure, but um, that, that was one thing, you know, if I go back, it's like, hmm, maybe, you know, I should have, talk to more mentors sooner, get you know, external um, input sooner. I think it's just took, took me a little longer. Okay, great. Carolyn. So I've worked for super big companies and I've worked for super small companies. And earlier in my career, I had decided specifically to work for more established companies. I, I really believed there was value to being more specialized in the context of an organization that already had a lot of, relatively a lot of processes in place. Um, I have loved working for a small company. And, and it's just because the impact of me as one individual and what I can accomplish at a small company is so different than what's possible at a larger company. Um, and, and therefore, uh, I also learn so much. I get to know so much more about what my colleagues are doing and how what I do impacts what they do. Um, and so that that would be something uh, that I would maybe change. I would I would maybe have begun to explore opportunities at at smaller companies, much smaller companies uh, earlier in my career because I've I've really just enjoyed that so much. Excellent, excellent. Jeffrey, how about you? Well, I'm, I'm very fortunate that the, I, I don't regret any of the career choices that I've made. I've, I've been, you know, I've been blessed to, to work some, for some really good organizations and I've learned a lot. I think the area that I, I, I to this day, I have to keep working is I'm an introvert. Uh, and so it's hard for me to walk up and just start talking to people. <laughs> and you really, you really have to do that to build relationships with people, uh, you know, especially people in first especially, you know, build relationships with other people and other companies doing jobs, because eventually someday you may be able to connect with them in some way that's going to help you in your career. So I have to get out of my comfort zone. And I know in this industry, there's a lot of people that are also introverts and you have to force yourself to um, to do, do what is uncomfortable because it will eventually pay benefits to you. That's a very good point. Katie? Yeah, you know, that's a great point, Jeffrey, about being an introvert. So I'm an introvert who plays an extrovert on the internet, you know, um, and um, the fact that I, I think regret wise in my career, um, one, I would have changed jobs more often, you know, we already talked about that a little bit. But, you know, if you don't do that in your career, sometimes you will find yourself um you will you will eventually find yourself working for people who have less experience than you. And that's that's just the reality. And maybe it's true in other other areas as well. But I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years, and that's certainly been my experience. Um, and then I would have started public speaking a lot sooner. Now, granted, at the time, there were really not a lot of conferences that welcomed newcomers at all. Now you have a plethora of different conference opportunities. You can do a B-sides. They even have special, um, you know, speaker coaches and mentors and things like that to help help you get going. But I never gave a talk until I think it was 2006. And um and it was really because I didn't believe that there was anything I could talk about that hadn't been done before, or if I wasn't dropping zero day during my talk, you know, with the circles that I was moving in that, that you know, nobody would, would be interested in what I had to say. So I would say, you know, for, for sure now, if you're just getting started, go give a talk. I mean, who cares? Uh, talk about, you know, your first year in InfoSec or breaking into the industry of inf information security. Those would be fascinating talks and guaranteed lots of people would be interested in what you have to say. Excellent. What would you say has been, 
have you had any twists in your career? Has there been something you were on a path, you know, maybe it was working a big incident or maybe it was, you know, working for a specific company and just that left turn came out of nowhere. Does, does anyone have a story around that? Just kind of that, that, that quick change of, of going into something and going, wow, here we go. So I made a transition from being what I refer to as a practitioner, meaning like on a security team with the job of, you know, protecting and defending that organization. Uh, And then I switched over to the vendor side and those are really different roles. And when I had originally been on kind of security teams and leading security teams, I thought that that was sort of the type of role that I was always interested in. Um, I find that I find that being on the vendor side gives me easier wins. <laughs> if that makes any sense. I, I feel like being on the practitioner side, it's sort of like all of the problems all of the time. And that is in- incredibly valuable. There, there's such an awesome opportunity for learning. Um, at the same time, there's also like thousands of security vendors trying to like buy you dinner and like be your best friend. And so there's, there can also be, especially if you're sort of in a budget owning management type of position, there can also be this like weird vibe. And I thought I wanted those things, you know, but I will say like on the vendor side, um, there are these business goals that can be achieved. And when those business goals get achieved or even exceeded, it feels super good. Um, so I, I think that for me, I kind of earlier in my career thought I would always be leading security teams. Uh, and it turns out I actually love uh, being on the vendor side and specializing and focusing on one particular problem uh, rather than being in a situation where my job is to manage all of the problems all the time. Awesome. Jeffrey, I think you had a little more to add. Yeah, well, I took uh, I took a leap uh, when I left CERT and um, uh, moved from incident response to product security, working for uh, Royal Phillips doing product security for medical devices. So that was back when that was just becoming uh, uh, a bigger issue. And that was great experience for me. It was completely different than what I had been doing uh, at CERT. But I realized several things while I well, I was there. One, I missed managing people because that was not a people leader role. And it was unlikely based on the people that were already in positions there that I was going to get to a people leader role soon. And I realized I missed incident response. So I was only there for three years and then moved to to, to secure works. Um, but that helped me f- figure out what I really wanted because after 20 years at CERT, it kind of like clouded my mind as to what I really wanted to do in the future. And that really, uh, it was a great experience, but it helped me realize that that wasn't the experience that I really wanted and it helped me move to a, to a role that, that was more fulfilling for me. Excellent. Thank you, Jeffrey. Katie, any, uh, any twists in your career? So twisted. <laughs> <laughs> We've, we've so, got a few minutes if you, you know, <laughs> depending I, on how. To, to elaborate on that, um, you know, I would say that um, it was it certainly my seven years at Microsoft were one, the duration of time that I spent at Microsoft was a surprise even to me. Right. Um, you know, I had been a Linux developer at the turn of the millennium and the fact that I joined Microsoft at all felt odd to me. But, you know, they, they were expanding roles and, and I was shifting and trying to decide what I wanted to do next because after a while, breaking into computers, while fun, um, it gets repetitive, it gets boring. And especially when you're seeing the same classes of vulnerabilities over and over again. So I would say maybe the biggest twist and, and surprise in my career is that we haven't solved basic, you know, injection flaw problem, right? Whole classes of vulnerabilities that I thought for sure, surely an ancient hacker such as myself cannot still break into things. But I mean, I hacked Clubhouse recently, that new audio oh. app. I was just like, huh, all right then. You know, I guess the more things change, the more 
VC will back whatever, you know? And, um, and I think the, the twists and turns in my career have just been um, absorbing the way that things are evolving while still staying so fundamentally basic that, um, you know, it is, it is such a, a breadth of um, the haves and have nots. And Wendy Nather uses the term security poverty line. And um, I, I would say I use the term security 1%, you know, because it's only the largest organizations that have the money and resources and vision and have been forced, you know, by harsh reality to truly invest in security and have these specialized roles. You actually don't see a lot of, of security specialized roles downstream in the ecosystem of vendors. Um, you know, I think, Sean, you and I didn't overlap at Microsoft at the same time, but you know the exact grind that I'm talking about in terms yes. of, you know, the, the security response team. But I think it was 2007, Popular Science called Microsoft Security Grunt one of the top 10 worst jobs in science. And it was between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. And it was not a lie. And we got t-shirts. So, I mean, maybe this is a convoluted and twisted answer to your question, but um, I would just say the entirety of my career has been full of surprises and I, I expect it will continue to be so. I believe I still have that t-shirt and having been a volunteer at a marine lab and, and having dealt in whale feces, uh, I will say the incident response to, uh, job was um, definitely some days a little worse. <laughs> Nazira, how about you? Any twists? Um, nothing really big twist. I mean, um, I think going back to what Katie said earlier, I mean, I spent 10 years at EMC at, and Dell slash, right? So that was a long, and so when I made that switch, um, it wasn't easy for me. It was like, let go 10 years, you know, you build a team, you build a program, you know, um, everybody knows you in, in, you know, leaving all that and starting kind of new, it was scary. Um, but I, you know, I think it was necessary for me um, to learn it, new things. And it was, you know, personal decisions as well. So, but I guess it's just, um, don't be afraid to make big changes. Um, Obviously, you know, get the input, get, get the information you need to, to, to make those, um, you know, decisions, but just don't, don't be scared. Um, sometimes you have to make big decisions. And, and sometimes jumping out of those, uh, like Carolyn was mentioning earlier, those uncomfortable, bad areas uh, and jumping into something new is scary, but also very rewarding. Yeah. I mean, in my case, it wasn't bad, right? I had a great career, right? It was me living a great team great career <laughs> and starting fresh um and, and that was a big decision for me but um i think sometimes you have to make those decisions to keep learning and now what would what would make you kind of go from doing something that's good and and you're enjoying and all to, to trying something completely new and kind of scary uh for me it was uh both you know personal decision uh, commute <laughs> when COVID wasn't there, uh, my commute was going to be like, we literally, and I have, you know, um, I had kid going to kindergarten. So it was, you know, a lot of it was a personal decision as well, but from the professional one, it's just, um, I was an incident response as well for a very, very long time. And my new role wasn't going to be an incident response. Uh, I mean, yes, we're going to support, you know, we support incident response, but it wasn't me making, you know, um, calls at night, making decisions on incidents. It was like, it's going to be completely different. Um, and I was also moving from on-prem, as you know, EMC and Dell, it's like we're selling hardware and software, uh, going to full cloud. So those were the things for me, um, you know, it was a learning opportunity for me to learn a completely different things. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. We've seen a lot, and uh, Katie mentioned earlier, all of the different um, ransomwares that are going on. And we've had a few more incidents, uh, ind industry-wide incidents, uh, I think just in the last couple months, half a year than I'd seen in a while. And I know we've been seeing numbers of incidents going up and up and up. What can practitioners and companies do better? Uh, whether it's championing, uh, championing new talent, uh, trying to fix, you know, the path they're on. I mean, Katie, you had mentioned earlier, the 1%, how most companies, uh, unless they're very large and, and have 
had incidents in the past aren't really even scaled to to deal with the kinds of incidents we're facing right now. It's, so what what should we be doing better? What should we be looking at? Well, I can start, you know, honestly, no matter how small your company is, multi-factor authenticate all the things. Just please multi-factor authenticate all the things and, um, and, and you will be in a lot better shape. Um, and certainly um, some of the ransomware attacks that we've seen, multi-factor authentication probably would have, would have um, you know, made the attackers move on to the next target. Um, and then the only other thing that I would say um, is that as your organization grows, attempt to grow your security capabilities in step with, you know, proportionately to the risks that not just your company is facing, but that your users, if you are a producer of technology, are facing. So that was my one beef with Clubhouse, you know, was that they had millions of users. And at the time that I contacted them to report the security vulnerabilities that I found, they had fewer employees than I did total. And, you know, they were already at the $4 billion, you know, rumors of acquisition by Twitter, $4 billion mark. So that's a disproportionate growth of your security capabilities, if I ever saw one. Um, and uh, I think that our industry, unfortunately, is incentivized towards, you know, building the features, scaling, um, getting the users, getting the data before, you know, organizations have had a chance to take a serious look at their security. So trying to stay in proportion with your risk and your problem set will help a lot of small companies. And hopefully they don't get so big that they are surprised by a middle-aged hacker who happened to find some stuff, along with my cat, who is here, by the way, and threatening this very this very panel that we are on. He may make an appearance. I'm we may get hacked. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Things um, doing. Yeah, Jeffrey. if I can just add, and I agree with Katie. I mean, so the most most companies are making still some of the most basic errors. So it's not like they need, you know, the, the most cutting edge thing. They're, they're, they don't have the basics down. I think the other thing that I would add is this is where I think communication and collaboration are, are very important as practitioners, making sure that your business partners, others in the business understand what some of the, the choices that they make, what the risks actually are, and helping communicate that upward become very important. And if you cannot effectively communicate and you can't collaborate with others, uh, or you take a very, you know, you know, brusque attitude towards people that you think don't get it, um, you're not really going to advance your your organization, and maybe even not advance your career if you if you if you don't. So I think those are very important factors in helping move a company forward. Awesome, Carolyn. I totally agree with Katie and Jeffrey. I think that it is really important to focus on the basics. It is really important to try and get the investment that's appropriate. One of the ways that I recommend that folks try to get the resources that's appropriate for an organization. You know, 15 years ago, a security in the in, a security incident in the news was like a very big deal. Uh, and I would say like today it's still a very big deal, but it's also increasingly common and we are kind of used to it. There's an opportunity for us as security practitioners to leverage recent incidents to explain to people who are not security practitioners how this could happen at our place. Maybe not like this exact same thing, but sort of an underlying theme and how that applies. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, to, to Jeffrey's point about communication and collaboration, uh, I continue to see security people wanting so much to speak the language of the business and, and just having a tough time with it. Um, and, and to those folks, uh, I would say, learn everything you can about how your organization works to achieve its goals um, and also sort of leverage current incidents and what happened uh, so that you can tell stories uh, that are interesting and relevant uh, about what may be going on uh, in your organization. Zara. 
Yeah, I just want to add on. I think um, a lot of us, I think, sometimes forget to bring our end customers and user along to our journey, right? Because um, a lot of things, you know, especially in the software industry, we make a lot of things available, but if they're not used by our end customers and users, they're useless, right? So sometimes we forget about that. And, you know, so we need to bring, you know, them along. So be making things easier for them to use or just basic education. Like, you know, I'm sure you guys could read like so many incidents, things related with, because customers didn't use the certain things that was already available <laughs> for them to, to use. Um, so, I mean, I've been in so many. So I think sometimes we forget that. So we need to always, um, and also we need to hear from them, right? We need to hear like why they are not using some of the security features we're making them available. Is it hard for them? Like what other things? So I think, we need to bring that feedback from our end, end, end users and customers. And sometimes we forget as a security practitioner because we are so focused internally. I think too, also like you were mentioning, you know, bringing the external and the internal folks along for the ride. I think the, the, the biggest uh, thing I got to do was taking my head of comms out for a beer one night and just explaining kind of how things can go sideways in, in the media. And uh, it was very helpful to, to get them on board with things that need to change. Um, let's move a little bit more to roles. So we, you all have had certainly different roles and, and, and different parts in your career. How are you seeing roles evolving? Um, are you seeing the industry going in a certain direction with security roles? Um, are you seeing places that are, you know, being left behind that we're missing or seeing maybe too much um, attention in one area versus another? What, how are you all seeing that? Katie? Well, I see a lot of attention on the hacking side of things and myself as a hacker, you know, I thought, wow, this is paradise, you know, or I would have thought that this is, this is what, present me, uh, middle-aged hacker me would, would have thought about it. But um, in fact, it's an unbalanced equation. You know, people are obsessed with zero days and obsessed with hacking. Um, and they're not really understanding that knowing about a flaw is, is less than half the battle. There are so many other security jobs that are so important and they're on the um, defense side or, or on the offense in, in order to, um, you know, help train the defense side. Um, and so I think that's that's one major thing, uh, you know, major theme that that I see people kind of focusing the wrong kinds of security attention when they do finally start paying attention to security, you know, um, uh, not to beat up on Clubhouse, but maybe a little bit to beat up on the VC model of growth first. Um, they didn't have a security team, which, you know, is understandable when they had under 10 employees at the time but they had a bug bounty and that seemed like a crazy place to be investing your early security dollars. I mean, absolutely insane. So, um, you know, I think that the other major thing that our industry is shifting towards, you know, not just this, you know, sort of been an ongoing theme of being obsessed with hacking, right? Um, but something else is that there are hardly any in entry level security positions. And I think that's a huge mistake. Um, when Caroline was talking about the fact that like there were entry level security positions at a major tech company, that it was like, oh yeah, those were rare even back then. Um, because what little security dollars you have, it makes sense from an organizational perspective. They're trying to get the most experienced, biggest bang for their buck candidate they can. But what they're missing is opportunities to train people who are there, not in a security role already, but want to move into security. So they're missing a huge opportunity of their existing personnel. And they're also missing, you know, opportunities to recruit and train uh, some folks who are in entry level, you know, sort of would be appropriate for entry level security jobs. I think that's a major pipeline problem. Um, and I heard at some point, you know, there's what, something like 3.1 unfilled cybersecurity jobs in the entire world, around half a million of them are in the United States alone. And um, I was hearing that over a million candidates tend to be competing for the same 10,000 or so entry level security jobs. So what do we need to do differently in our industry? have more entry level jobs and do a lot more lateral cross training from within organizations to not just educate everybody more about security, but actually to pull from the business and they know their area of the business very well and pull them into security. 
think that's a great point, Katie. And I know one of the things I've heard in the past is, well, I'm going to train them up and then they're going to go leave and make more money at another company. What do you say to that? Let them leave. If you can. Yes, good. Help, that's right? good. Yeah. If you can't compel them with enough benefits and reasons to stay in career opportunities, then they should go and you should namaste them right out the door. You know, <laughs> Jeffrey. No, I completely agree. I, you know, we training is extremely important for us. We, it's one of those sacrosanct things that doesn't, doesn't get touched. You have to help people learn and grow. This industry is changing too fast. If you don't and you, you, you leave the people, they're not only disgruntled, but then they're not able to do the job anymore because everything's changed around them and they haven't, haven't learned. I also completely agree with Katie about entry level. There was a really good article in the Australia Financial Review about a week ago talking about how businesses are starting to turn towards non-traditional uh, backgrounds to, in, to bring them into security. Psychology was one of the things they were talking about, bringing people with psychology skills and then training them on other things. To We have to in this in this industry. We have to, have to do that. The only th other thing that I would note is things are a lot more collaborative today than they were when I started in security many, many years ago. You have to be a team player. These things are so complicated when you get into these situations. No one person can be able to solve these things alone. So you have to have the people with skills. And when I'm interviewing people, collaboration and ability to communicate with them, that's the most important thing I look for when I'm, when I'm interviewing for people. Because the, the days of having a single person go in the closet, you know, slide pieces under the door, and then they come out with the answer, those are long, those are long gone. Awesome. Carolyn. I think that our industry has a challenge when it comes to writing job descriptions. I think we are not so good at that. And I think it's super hard both for the hiring manager and for the candidate. There is an opportunity here, I think. Um, I do think that some hiring managers have a tendency to rely on HR teams and recruiters to help them. Um, and I think that trying to fill a security role is, is pretty different from trying to fill a lot of other different roles for a lot of different reasons. And there's all these mismatches, you know, and I do think that if we as an industry could get better at writing job descriptions, like figuring out actually what it is that we need and want and then writing it down clearly, then, then that would, that would help. I think that's, I think that's very difficult. And I think it's super difficult both on their hiring manager side, as well as the candidate side. I mean, it is absurd that on one hand, we've got like 3 million unfilled jobs and however many million people who really want these jobs and we can't do the matching. Um, so that, I think, uh, is an unsolved opportunity. I think you had a great point there, too, about, you know, involving HR. And do you see that maybe that HR, they're more generalist and maybe not as used to dealing with the security personality that we sometimes see in the industry? Or So I had another super um, unexpected twist in my role a couple of years ago, which is to say, I now have 16 years of experience in information security, and I'm also the head of people at my company right now, which means I oversee people operations and talent acquisition. And I think the, the it's actually a data problem. And what I mean by that is if you're like a recruiter or a, a, a people ops person, there's, there's like data that you can get about roles and locations and levels. And that data for security is sort of all over the place. And so what happens a lot is that security roles get categorized incorrectly. And then you're actually looking for a person at such and such level, but the way that your compensation band is structured, it's at such and such other level. And, and there's, there's a severe lack of data um, so I, I think that that's really uh, where folks struggle that and I think that I think that hiring managers, you know, a hiring manager is a hiring manager in security is not only hiring a team for security, they're also managing their team, 
trying to keep everyone emotionally afloat, doing their job, putting out fires, trying to train, trying to strategize, trying to ask for money. And so the recruiting and the focus on that ends up being maybe like 5% of a person's job. And, and I actually have come to learn that for a hiring manager, if you're going to do a very good job at recruiting, it takes at least 25% of a person's job, I think. And so there's, there's kind of not enough time and it's difficult to prioritize the time that it takes, I think, to do well, which is where you get sort of like these copy paste job descriptions that don't actually match what you're looking for, where you get sort of a lack of justifying an appropriate level for what you're actually looking for, or you you're maybe don't have the space and the time to brainstorm like, oh, instead of this like one senior role, could I sort of like break it up into two or three more junior roles and have folks, you know, specialize, you know, all, all of those things take time. And one of the things that security hiring managers don't have a lot of is time. Okay, I want to share one tip with a hiring manager, if you don't mind, that worked Thanks. for me and it will save you a lot of time. Spend 30 minutes to do live sourcing with a recruiter once. Right. Once you have a job description, spend 30 minutes, do live sourcing, and it helped tremendously. Then you don't have to waste your time reviewing hundreds and hundreds of resumes that do not match what you want. So invest that time upfront, do live sourcing, and it will help you a lot. So that's one tip that um, has been helping me. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. You know, we so we, we've talked about kind of how everybody got into their careers and the twists and the roles. What keeps y'all up at night? You know, I, I it, like we've mentioned, there's still nothing's it, nothing seems to have been solved. <laughs> We're still doing a lot of the same things, if not at, at the larger levels, all the all the newer and smaller companies coming up. What what kind of makes you fear a little bit? Okay, besides the obvious answer of Scappy the cat keeps me up at night, which is <laughs> absolutely true. Um, I would say, you know, honestly, national security has been on my mind for a very long time. And the fact that um, our incident responders, especially at the federal level, are under-resourced. They are understaffed. They lack the people process and tech to do their jobs effectively, um, that really concerns me. And um, you know, I gave testimony before Congress a couple weeks ago on supply chain, software supply chain um, security, and you know, the fact that the recent executive order in the United States covers cybersecurity to such great extent is wonderful on the one hand, but it's also you know kind of like it's almost like turning to the federal government and the private sector and saying, have you considered being more secure? Because this is what, you know, this is what you should do is be more secure now. And it's, you know, to me, it just feels like there's so, there's been so little consistent investment across administrations, across the private industry, that Ransomware is just one very loud symptom of a problem that we on this panel have known has just been simmering this entire time, you know? So what keeps me up at night? It's that we've reached the boiling point and it's, you know, there's no better time to get into cybersecurity if one is considering a career in it because there are, you know, it's like precincts without fire stations. Um, there's there's absolutely a lot of work to do. So that plus the cat, really, they keep me up at night. Can't, can't help you with the cat, but. <laughs> Carolyn. From my perspective, and it's maybe not sort of only an infosec thing, but when I think about my young children, I have two kids below the age of 10. And I think about like their lives and what the big challenge of their lives is. I feel like when I was growing up, there was like an agreed upon set of facts that people believed. And I think that's not the case today. I think disinformation is rampant. And I think that that is just the super fascinating phenomenon, you know? And I think that as security professionals, you know, integrity of information has always been of utmost importance to us. And I think we have an opportunity 
Um, but I certainly don't know how to go about solving it, which is why it keeps me up at night. That to me is absolutely terrifying. Yipes. Jeffrey, what keeps you up at night? Uh, well, I'll, I'll pick something different than what my other colleagues have said. And I think, uh, you know, privacy issues, I think, and the need for people to better understand them. And I think as professionals, it, we really need to help people, people that are not technologists, understand why privacy issues are important to them. I mean, when we talk about, you can combine this with getting people interested in the field, but go to schools, go to, as a, as a professional in this industry and, uh, and speak to them about, about these kinds of issues. And it kind of will touch back on something that Katie talked about before, not, not speaking early enough in her career. Uh, everyone in this industry, no matter what level you are, you're at the level where you can go into a school and talk to, talk to students uh, about the work you do, about the pressing issues of the day. And they will ask you, they're smart. They will ask you very intelligent questions and very challenging questions. But I think, it, you know, it's our duty to, to go and, and, and help educate those, those, uh, those folks. Excellent. Excellent. So we've talked about the nightmares, including the cats. Um, where do you see hope for the future? Where do you see things getting better? I think, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Katie. No, ahead, Katie. I was going to say that, um, you know, I have a couple of kids as well, and um, all of my hope is is wrapped up in them and, and their generation and, you know, not just what they will do, but hopefully what they won't do with technology. <laughs> Frankly, um, you know, we are building things faster than we can secure them. We've always done this, but at this point it is exceeding, you know, even our ability to keep up with, with the needs and of, of all of these threats. So um, my hope for the future is, is that we will um, grow a little wiser, you know, with uh, our, our building of technology just because we can doesn't mean we should necessarily build it um, and that we'll, um, we'll start having better and more knowledgeable lawmakers and regulators who can help um, shape the industry without holding it back and without um, you know, chilling security research, for example, um, in, in their willingness to regulate these systems. Um, so anyway, I think that there are more technologists like me and others who are willing to help with that regulatory process um, and hopefully shape an industry that we can all live with, whether or not, uh, you know, re regardless of how fast computers get and, and how close we are to true AI and all of that, um, I'm, I am hopeful. Awesome, Jeffrey. I was going to say the same thing Katie said. It's really the, it's the youth of, of today. And as they, the, those who have grown up with, with a much higher level of technology than any of us had when we grew up, as they get older, the average understanding of technology is going to increase. You know, you have lawmakers that are 80 years old. You know, the, the technology, biggest technology when they grew up was a telephone that was a party line in their, in their house. So, you know, as, as people, as the youth get, uh, older, they will have a much better understanding. And I, I think the more that we do to help them not just understand the technology, but understand the, the societal issues that that technology poses, um, the better we will be in the future. Excellent. Carolyn. I think that education is gonna be different for my young children than it was for me. My husband and I went through like traditional American education, which really just means a lot of student loans. Um, and I think for my kids, like one of, there were so many amazing things that came out of the pandemic and a lot of them had to do with technology. My six-year-old is proficient 
on Zoom. She's more proficient than I am on Zoom. I, I literally look over her shoulder and I'm like, oh my gosh, you can do that. She's like, yeah, duh, mom. And um, she's learning to code. Um, I wish I learned to code the way that she's learning to code because it's actually fun. <laughs> you can take in today's world, which I think you couldn't 20 years ago, the very best, most engaging, most interesting teacher. And that teacher can teach everyone about a topic in the entire world who has internet. Now, only half the world has internet. It's easy to think because of the situation that we're in that everyone has internet, not everyone has internet. That is a separate problem. Um, but I do think that education is gonna change for the better. I think that there's going to be more focus on things that people want to learn and things that people need to learn. And I think that uh, people are going to have more and more access to learning if, if they choose it. Excellent. Is there any, any hopes, any uh, bright lights that you see? Yeah, just to add what Carolyn said, I mean, COVID's changed a lot of things, right? I mean, COVID, uh, COVID drove a lot of innovation, um, which is sometimes scary, especially the areas that I support. There's like, wow. Um, and so, but I think it's, it's hopefully it's going to also drive the accessibility, right? That people have more access to things that they didn't have. I think, you know, the uh, security talent pool is going to be wider. Now, you know, we, we don't have these restrictions of, oh, you have to be in the Bay Area, you have to be in the, you know, Boston to apply for this job. So I think we're going to have much more um, larger talent pool being more open about remote work. So those are the things that excites me. Um, and, and yeah, the, the youth, I mean, my 70 year old. <laughs> She, she's awesome on Zoom, right? And I was like, oh, where is this button? Um, but yeah, I'm just excited to see things through her eyes. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for, for the uh, younger generation. I mean, I, you know, I've seen this with all the stuff happening around us, you know, how high school students and middle school uh, students here in the area are speaking up and you know, how they're showing their empathy much more than a lot of adults. <laughs> In, in most cases, so I'm really, really helpful about the youth that, you know, they will, they will make the changes that we all need. Excellent. We've got two minutes left. I had one last question, see if we can sneak it in. We've, we've gone through careers and, and, and twists and, and, and the hope for the future. What is the one bit of advice you would give your younger self at this point that you, as you were starting your career, what would you, what would you say to yourself? I would say that um, like all sorts of stuff is going to happen that you can't predict and that you won't expect. And some of it will be amazing and some of it will be not amazing. And I would say that um, like to, to trust yourself, to know that whatever happens, you will be there on the other side to catch yourself, to know that you are so capable that no matter what comes up, you can handle it. That would have been so nice to know as a younger person. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. And ask for help. Um, no one can know everything. Uh, and I think people sometimes, they, they, they feel, think people will think that they're weak if they do that. And that, that's not the case. If I see people say, I don't know, that's actually a positive. I think uh, a couple things. Uh, one, I would have told my younger self to start a company. Um, the fact that I waited until I was in my 40s to start a company made me realize I should have started a company in my 20s. So start a company. Um, and then, you know, when I wasn't being paid enough and I wasn't being promoted and I wasn't being recognized, I wish I had told myself um, in more emphatic terms to take that job and shove it, you know? so. Uh, that, that's the advice I would give my younger self. Start a company a lot sooner. And if you're not in a position to do so, um, you know, then make sure that you are serving, ser your loyalty should be to yourself, not to any particular job or team or whatnot. Um, Career-wise, your loyalty really has to be to yourself. And um, you will build 
uh, great things wherever you are and um, anyone is lucky to have you. So I wish, I wish my younger self had heard those words. To me, I guess <clears throat> one thing I would say, don't be afraid of um, taking on new challenges, right? That there will be a people, there will be a team to who will support you. You're never gonna be alone. You know, sometimes you feel like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do it by myself? But you are never alone. So you always have somebody uh, who's gonna champion you, who's gonna help you. So don't be afraid of um, taking uh, bigger things. Excellent. And with that, I'm going to close out our panel. I want to thank you all so much. This has been an honor to, to talk with you all today. And thank you for those who got up a little earlier than usual. Uh, Carolyn, Jeffrey, Katie, Nazera, thank you again for joining us here at FIRST. And we really appreciate your participation. And to all of you who, who joined us live to watch this, thank you for joining us. And we will be right back uh, in just a few moments. <laughs>